the three parts of a, a sustainable energy future are sustainable energy generation, storage, and electric vehicles. Uh, so to, achieve, to, to accelerate, the, accelerate the transition to sustainable energy, we must produce more uh, EVs that need to be affordable um, and a lot more energy storage uh, while building fa factories faster and with fa far less investment. Uh, goal number one is a terawatt hour scale battery production. So tera is the new giga. Uh, and a terawatt is a, a thousand times more than a gigawatt. So uh, we used to talk in terms of gigawatts. Uh, in the future, we'll be talking in terms of uh, terawatt hours. So this is um, what's needed in order to transition the world to sustainability. Um, yeah, and you can see it's a, we're talking about a 100x growth in batteries for electric vehicles to achieve this mission. Um, and we are going to get there. It's just a matter of how fast. And our intention is to accelerate it. And then on the grid side, uh, we, we have a similar mountain to climb, 1,600 times growth from today's grid batteries to go 100% renewable on the grid and to take all of the existing heating fossil fuel uses in homes and businesses 100% electric. So today's batteries cannot scale fast enough. Uh, they're just too small. Um, for Giga, Giga Nevada, um, 150 gigawatt hours per year is like what we probably expect to, to make out of there. But this is really pretty small in the grand scheme of things. That's only 0.15 terawatt hours. We would need 135 fully built out Nevada gigafactories to achieve 20 terawatt hours a year. It's not scalable enough of a solution. We need a dramatic rethink of the cell manufacturing system to, to scale as fast as we can and should. It's not just a question of like, well, if we had $2 trillion, you, tomorrow you could make this. It's, it's not that easy. Um, you actually need to organize a massive number of people, build a lot of machines, build the machines that make the machines. Um, and so it's incredibly important to uh, have that effort uh, yield the most number of batteries. So, uh, and, and then goal two, obviously, we need to make uh, more affordable cars. Um, the, uh, you know, I think one of the things that troubles me the most is that we, we don't yet have a truly affordable car. Um, and that, that is something that we will make in the future. Uh, but in order to do that, um, we've got to get the cost of batteries down, we've got to make, uh, and we've got to be better at manufacturing, and, and we need to do something about this curve. This cur the curve of, of the cost per kilowatt hour of, of batteries is not improving fast enough. Um, so we, we give the, we've given this a lot of thought over many years uh, to say, okay, how can we radically improve the, the cost per kilowatt hour curve? Um, it, it's been somewhat flattening out, actually, in, in recent yeah. years. So I mean, early growth was promising, but you can see we're kind of plateauing. Yeah. So that's, that's what's motivating us to, to rethink how cells are produced and designed. That's why we got Battery Day. Yeah. To make the best cars in the world, we design vehicles and factories from the ground up. Next. Yeah. <laughs> and now we do this for batteries as well. We have a plan to have the cost per kilowatt hour. And it's not a plan that rests on a single innovation, some research project that'll never see the light of day. It's a plan that has taken creative engineering and industrialization across every facet of what makes a cell into a battery pack from raw material to the finished thing. And we're gonna go through that plan with you today, step by step, and build up how we get to these goals and how we accelerate this transition and make our vehicles and our, our grid batteries more affordable. We've got the cap and the, and the can negative and positive terminals of the cell. When you open that cell, you've got a tab connected to those terminals, what we call the jelly roll, which is the wound electrodes on the inside. Um, you can actually see what this looks like as you unwind it. This is over a meter long in a typical 2170 cell. So it's quite a long wi winding process. Um, and, and you can see the tab still there. Um, and then, what, to explain what's actually going on here, we've identified we've got anode, cathode, separator, positive and negative terminal. Watch what happens as we, uh, there we go, discharge the cell. Got lithium moving from anode to cathode. And then the reverse, when we charge the cell, anode moving from, uh, lithium moving from cathode to anode across the separator. This is the basic of what makes all lithium ion batteries, whether they're no matter what the form factor is. And when we look at what, what's happened to date, at least in our products, we've moved from the 18650 form factor to the 2170 form factor through great collaboration with our partners, Panasonic, 
new partners like LG and CATL and probably others in the future. Yeah. Um, and this was, this was a evolutionary step going from 1865 to 2170, bringing 50% more energy into the cell. But when we look to the ideal cell design, if we were to do it ourselves, uh, we need to go beyond just um, what we're looking at us in front of us and, and study the full, the full spectrum of options. So as you can see, we, we kind of swept the key me figures of merit, how much we can reduce the cost and how much vehicle range increases as we change the outer diameter of the cell. We found a sweet spot somewhere around 46 meters, uh, millimeters. There are problems uh, as you make cells larger. In fact, supercharging and thermals in general become really challenging as you make bigger cells. And this was the challenge that our team uh, set our sights on to overcome. And we did. We came up with this tabless architecture that maybe you've heard about um, that, that basically removes the thermal problem from the equation and allows us to go to the absolute lowest cost form factor um, and the simplest manufacturing process. And this is what, this is what we mean when we, when we talk about tabless. It's kind of a beautiful thing. We basically took the existing foils, laser patterned them, and enabled dozens of connections into the active material through this shingled spiral you can see. With simpler manufacturing, fewer parts, 50, 50 millimeter versus 250 millimeter electrical path length, uh, which is how we get all the thermal benefits. Yeah, this is important to appreciate. Like basically the, 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 the distance that that electron has to travel, you know, it's, it's just much less. Um, so uh, you actually have a shorter path length in a large tabless, a large tabless cell than you have in the smaller cell with tabs. So this is a big deal. So even though the, the cell is bigger, it actually has uh, more power. So just the cell form factor change enables a 14% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction, just that cell form factor change. Let's talk a little bit about what's in a cell factory. First, there's an electrode process where the active materials are coated into films, onto foils. Um, then those foil, coated foils are wound in the, in the winding process we just talked about, where if you do have tabs, you have to start and stop a lot. Um, then the, the jelly roll is assembled into the can, sealed, uh, filled with electrolyte, and then sent to formation, where the cell is charged for the first time, and, and where the, sort of the electrochemistry is set and the quality of the cell is verified. And we set out at every step of this process to try to take that inspiration we just saw, showed and, and think about how we make those processes fundamentally better and more scalable. And one of the most important processes is where it all begins, the wet process of the, uh, of the electrode coating. And I, just to give you all a sense of scale, I'm gonna walk through what's in that wet process. You've got mixing where the, the powders are mixed with either a water or a solvent, solvents for, for the cathode. Um, that mix then goes into a large coat and dry oven where the slurry is coated onto the foil, you know, huge ovens, tens of meters long, dried, uh, and that solvent then has to be recovered. You can see the solvent recovery system. And then finally, the coated foil is compressed to the final density. And when you're looking at this, you're like, wow, that's a lot of equipment for one step, especially when you consider that little speck next to the coating oven is a person. This is serious, serious iron involved in making batteries. Wouldn't it be great if we could skip that solvent step, which is one of those dig a ditch and then fill it kind of things where you put the solvent in and then take it out and recycle it and just go straight to dr uh, uh, dry mix to coat. And that's what the dry process really is about. And in the most basic form, you can see it here on a bench top. Literally, powder in into film, as simple as that, becomes this. Yeah. So you can see the motivation. A 10 times reduction in footprint a 10 times reduction in energy and a massive reduction in investment. Uh, but this is a, a really profound improvement. Again, for people that know battery uh, manufacturing, this is, a, this is gigantic. Um, we'll probably be on, on machine revision six or seven by the time we do large scale production. Um, the, the rate at which the machines are being improved is, is extremely rapid, like literally every three or four months is a new rev. The key to a high performing assembly line is 
accomplishing processes while in motion, continuous motion, uh, and thinking of the line as a highway, max velocity down the highway, no start yeah. and stop, no city driving. Exactly, no st stop lights and traffic lights or anything. You want the highway. I want the highway. Yeah. And together with our internal design team that makes this equipment and designs this equipment, we coupled thinking about how to make the best cell with thinking about how to make the best equipment so that we could accomplish the fastest parts per minute rates on all of these tools. Um, and through all of that development, we were able to get to the point where we can uh, implement assembly lines, one line, 20 gigawatt hours, seven times increase in output per line. And when you're thinking about scalability mm -hmm. and pure effort, having one line be 7x the capability is just effort multiplying. Yeah. In a typical cell factory, formation represents 25% of the investment. And what is formation? It's, it's charging and discharging cells and verifying the quality of the cell. Turns out we've charged and discharged billions and billions of cells in our vehicles, so we know a thing or two about that. The typical formation setup is you charge and discharge each cell individually. In our car, we charge thousands of cells at once. And we took our principal and our power electronics, leveraging p power wall, vehicle battery management systems, and others to dramatically improve the, the formation equipment uh, cost effectiveness and density. 86% reduction in formation investment, 75% reduction in footprint. So essentially what this translates to, based on what we know today, is about a 75% reduction uh, in the investment per kilowatt hour, uh, or gigawatt hour. It's, it's just, uh, we're able to, from a volume standpoint, actually get what, um, in, in a smaller form factor than Giga Nevada, uh, we were able to get uh, many times the the, the uh, cell output. So uh, you can see, like, basically, we can get a terawatt hour in le in less space than it took to make a gigawatt hour. Uh, uh, you know, it, uh, 150 gigawatt hours. As I tweeted out earlier, we will continue to uh, use our cell suppliers, uh, Panasonic and uh, LG and CATL, um, and so this is 100 gigawatt hours supplemental to uh, what we buy from suppliers. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, th this this does like reduce our weighted average cost of a cell because uh, if it, but it does it allows us to make a lot more cars and a lot more stationary storage. Um, and, um, and then long term, we're uh, expecting to make on the order of uh, 3,000 gigawatt hours or, or three terawatt hours per year. Um, I, think we can, I think we've got a good chance of, of achieving this actually before 2030, but I, I'm highly confident that we could do it by, by 2030. And not only is all of that manufacturing innovation fantastic for enabling scale. It's also an additional 18% reduction in dollar per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. So we have a manufacturing system. We've got a cell design. What are the active materials we're going to put in that cell design? Let's talk about the anode first. Let's talk about silicon. Why is silicon awesome? It's awesome because it's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust after oxygen, which means it's everywhere. It's sand. Yeah. Um, Sand is silicon dioxide. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it happens to store nine times more lithium than graphite, which is the typical anode material in, in lithium-ion batteries today. So why isn't everybody using it? The re main reason is because the challenge with silicon is that it expands 4x when fully charged with lithium. And basically, all of that expansion stress on the particle, the particles start cracking. They start electrically isolating. You lose capacity. The energy retention of the battery starts to fade. And it also gums up with a passivation layer that has to keep reforming as the particles expand. What we're proposing is a step change in capability and a, and a step change in cost. And what that really is, is to just go to the raw metallurgical silicon itself. Don't engineer the base metal. Just start with that and design for it to expand in how you think of the, the particle in the electro design and, and how you, you code it. Yeah, I'm not sure if you saw this. Basically, a dollar. Uh, per kilowatt hours. Yeah. Um, basically, if, if, you, if, you, if you use simple silicon, it's dramatically less than even the silicon that is currently used in the batteries that are made today. Um, and you can use a lot more of it. The anode would cost, yeah, with this silicon, and the anode costs $1.20 a kilowatt hour. Um, and in the end, by leveraging this silicon to its potential, we can increase the range of our vehicles by an additional 20%, just this uh, improvement. Yeah, it gets cheaper and longer range.
Yeah, and, and when we take that anode cost reduction, we're looking at another 5% dollar per kilo, kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level. And there's more. Let's talk about cathodes. What is a battery cathode? Cathodes are like bookshelves where the metal, you know, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, or aluminum is like the shelf, and the lithium is the book. And really, what sets apart these different metals is how many books of lithium they can fit on the shelves and how sturdy the shelves are. It's, it's tough to exactly figure out what the right analogy is to explain uh, cathode and, and anode, but a bookshelf is probably a pretty good one um, in the sense that um, you, you, need, you need a stable structure uh, to contain the ions. Um, so you want a structure that does not uh, crumble or get gooey or basically that, that holds its shape in both the cathode and the anode. Um, as you're moving these ions, ions back and forth, uh, you, you, it needs to retain its structure. Uh, so uh, if it doesn't retain its structure, then you lose cycle life and your battery capacity drops very quickly. The thing to consider is just fundamentally what the, nickel, the, the, the metals are capable of, and that's what we have on the chart here. Dollar per kilowatt hour cathode of just the metal, using just LME, you know, London Metal Exchange prices, um, versus the energy density of just the cathode. And you can see nickel is the cheapest and the highest energy density, and that's why increasing nickel is a goal of ours and really everybody's in the energy and in the uh, battery industry. Um, but one of the reasons why cobalt is even used at all is because it is a very stable bookshelf. And the challenge with going to pure nickel is stabilizing that bookshelf with only nickel. And that's what we've been working on with our high nickel co cathode development, which has zero cobalt in it. Leveraging novel coatings and dop novel coatings and dopants, uh, we can get a 15% reduction in cathode dollar per kilowatt hour. Um, so, in, in order to scale, uh, we really need to make sure that we're not constrained by total nickel availability. Um, I actually spoke with uh, the CEOs of the biggest mining companies in the world and said, uh, "Please make more nickel. <laughs> it's very important." Um, and so, th I think they are going to make more nickel. Uh, but uh, it, I, there's also, uh, you know, uh, I think we need to have. A, a, a kind of a three-tiered approach to, to batteries. Um, so starting with iron, that's kind of like a medium range, and then nickel manganese as sort of a medium plus uh, uh, intermediate, um, and then a high nickel for long-range applications like Cybertruck and uh, the semi. Um, something like a, like a semi truck, it's extremely important to have a uh, high energy density uh, in order to get long range. So, um, and, and uh, just to give sort of iron a, a bit um, more time, like the, uh, Although the, you know, if you look at the uh, watt hours per kilogram uh, at the cathode level of, um, of iron, uh, it looks like nickel's twice as good. Uh, but when you fully considered at the pack level everything else taken into account, uh, nickel is about maybe 50 or 60 percent better than uh, uh, than iron. So I iron is not is little better than it would seem when you t when you look at it at the uh, the pack level fully considered. Um, it's, still, it's not as good as nickel. Nickel is like 50 to 60 percent better. Uh, but it's still pr it's actually pretty good, um, and so you know g good for stationary storage and for uh, medium range applications uh, where energy density is not paramount. And then, like I said, for intermediate, uh, it's kind of a nickel manganese, um, and it's uh, relatively straightforward to do a cathode that's uh, two thirds nickel, one third manganese, uh, which would then allow uh, us to make 50 percent more uh, cell volume uh, with the same amount of nickel. And with very little energy trade-off. I mean, yeah. just enough to, to, to have you still want to use 100% nickel for something like a, a semi-truck, but, but really not much of a sacrifice at all. Yeah. Because a lot of people spend time talking about the metals. Actually, the cathode process itself is a big target. 35% of the cathode dollar per kilowatt hour is just in mo transferring it into its final form. And so we see that as a big target, and we, we decided to take that on. Um, here's a view of the traditional cathode process. Effectively, uh -huh. if you start at the left and you have the metal from the, the mine, the first thing that happens is the metal from the mine is changed into an intermediate thing called a metal sulfate, because that's just happened to be what chemists wanted a long time ago. And then, you, and then when you're making the cathode, you have to take this intermediate thing called a metal sulfate, add chemicals, add a whole bunch of water, a whole bunch of stuff happens in the middle, and at the end, you get that little bit of cathode and a whole bunch of wastewater and byproducts. It's like how it was done before. And then they connected the dots, but really didn't think of the whole thing from like a first principle standpoint, saying how do we get from 
the nickel ore in the ground to the finished nickel product for a battery. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at the entire value chain and said, how can we make this as simple as possible? And that's what we're proposing here with our process. As you can see, a whole, less, a whole lot less is going on here. We get rid of the intermediate, metal water, final pro product cathode, recirculate the water, no wastewater at all. And when you summarize all of that, it's to 66% reduction in CapEx investment, a 76 reduction in process cost, and zero wastewater. Much more scalable solution. Yeah. Um, and now that we have this process, obviously we're going to go and start building our own cathode facility in North America and leveraging all of the North American resources that exist for nickel and lithium. And just doing that, just localizing our cathode supply chain and production, we can reduce miles traveled by all the materials that end up in the cathode by 80%, which is huge for cost. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, cathode production would be part of our the, te the Tesla cell production plant. So it would just be, you know, basically, you know, uh, raw materials coming from the mine, and uh, from raw materials in the mine, out comes a battery. Uh, but it, it is important to say, like, okay, what is the smartest way to uh, take the ore and uh, extract the lithium and, and do so in an environmentally friendly way? Um, and w we actually discovered a, again, looking at a sort of first principles physics standpoint, um, in, instead of just the way it's always been done, um, is we found that uh, we can actually use table salt, uh, sodium chloride, uh, to uh, basically ex extract the lithium from the ore. <laughs> we actually got... Uh, rights to a, a lithium clay deposit in Nevada. Over um, 10,000 acres. Over 10,000 acres. Um, and then the, the nature of the mining is actually, I think, also very environmentally uh, sensitive in that we, we, we sort of take a chunk of dirt out of the ground, or remove the lithium, and then put the chunk of dirt back where it was. So it will look pretty much the same as before, uh, and it will not look like terrible. Um, and eventually, as we said at the beginning, when we get to this steady state 20 terawatt hours per year of production, we will tr transfer the entire non-renewable fleet of both power plants, home heating and, 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 batter and, and industry heating, and, and vehicles to electric. And at that point, we have an awesome resource in those batteries to recycle to make new batteries. So we don't need to do any more mining at that point. And you can see why. Yeah. R r the, the, the difference in the, the value of the, of the material coming back from the vehicle versus the ground, you'd always go to the vehicle. And we recycle 100% of our vehicle batteries today. So um, I mean, there's an architecture that um, we've been wanting to do with Tesla for a long time, uh, and we're finally, we finally figured it out. Um, and I think it's, it's the way that all electric cars in the future will ultimately be made. Uh, it's the right way, to, right way to do things. Um, so it's, it's, it starts with uh, having a single piece casting, or a single piece casting for the front body and the rear body. Um, and uh, in order to do this, we uh, commissioned the, the largest casting machine that has ever been made. And it's currently working just uh, over the road at our uh, Fremont plant. Uh, we have the, the, the it's pretty sweet. Um, ma making the uh, entire, currently making the entire uh, rear section of the car in a, as a single piece high pressure die cast aluminum. Um, and in order to do this, we actually uh, had to develop our own alloy uh, because we wanted a high strength casting alloy that not, did not require coatings or heat treatment. That then inter the interfaces to uh, what we call the structural battery, where the battery for the first time will have dual use. Uh, the battery will both have the use as an energy device and as structure. So, so this is really quite profound. Uh, the Effectively, the, the non-cell portion of the battery has negative mass. So it, we, we save so much mass in the rest of the vehicle, we, we save more mass in the rest of the vehicle than the non-cell portion of the battery. So it's like, well, how, how do you really minimize the mass of a battery? Make it negative. Make the battery non-cell portion of the battery pack negative. Um, so um, it, it also allows us to pack the cells more densely because we do not have uh, intermediate structure in the battery pack. So instead of having these like uh, supports and stabilizers and stringers and structural elements in the battery, we now have a lot more space in the battery because the pack itself is structural. So it improves the mass efficiency of the battery. Um, and then the, those castings are also quite important because you want to transfer load into the structural battery pack uh, in a very smooth, continuous way. Um, so you don't um, put uh, arbitrary point loads into the battery. 
Um, so you, you kind of have to, you, you want to sort of feather the load out from the front and rear uh, into the structural battery. Um, it also allows us to uh, use uh, to, to move the, the cells uh, closer to the center of the of the car um, because we don't have the the, the, the the in the top one we've got that sort of all the supports and stuff. So the, the volumetric efficiency of the structural pack is is much better than a non-structural pack. And we actually bring the cells closer to the center. Um, and uh, because they're closer to the center, the, uh, it reduces the probability of, uh, of a side impact uh, potentially contacting the cells. Because they have, it has to go, in, any kind of side impact has to go further in order to reach the cells. Uh, it also proves uh, what's called the polar moment of inertia, uh, which is that you can think of like when there's a like, uh, ice skater, uh, arms out or arms in. Arms in, you rotate faster. So if you can uh, bring things closer to the center, you reduce the polar moment of inertia, and that means you can, you, the car maneuvers better. It just feels better. You don't want to know why, but it just, it just feels more agile. Like I said, so 10% mass reduction in, in the body of the car, 14% range increase, uh, 370 fewer parts. So we're looking at over 50% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, 35% reduction in floor space, and we'll continue to improve that as we make the vehicle factory of the future. And in addition to the improvements we just said on enabling additional range and improving the structural performance of the vehicle, it is worth another 7% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level, bringing our total reductions now to 56% dollars per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Range increase, we're unlocking up to 54% increase in range for our vehicles and energy density for our energy products. 56% uh, reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level and a 69% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, which is the true enabler when we talk back about how do we achieve this scale problem here. What does this mean for our future products? Uh, so uh, we, you know, we're confident that long term we can design and, and manufacture a, a, a compelling $25,000 electric vehicle. Um, and uh, we should probably talk about uh, the you know, Model S Plaid. You know, what about that? <laughs>